Hi everyone. Now that we have the house rules out of the way, can I just take this opportunity to introduce our special speaker of this afternoon? He is none other than Mr. Jack Stone. Mr. Stone, or rather Jack as he likes to be known, he is a 20-year qualifying and life member of the MDRT. He has business experience in both private and public companies before entering the life insurance industry in 1984. Now, Jack was a regular speaker for his company's masterclass program. And if you're wondering which company it is, I'll tell you. It was Zurich Financial Services. All right. Now, the practice of Jack Stone and company within Allied Dunbar and Zurich became one of the most successful in Scotland and had over 3,000 clients and a range over £150 million of life protection, with clients investing at the rate of approximately £2.8 million per year. Personally, now, Jack is producing first-year commissions of £20,000 a month. Yes. So he has a very successful practice, and in fact, he, he only sees people or clients who are referred. Okay, his business is primarily through referrals. All right. In fact, he jokes that he will not entertain any walk-ins. So let's get the full tips from this guru this afternoon. Let's get the most of this session. Let's give him a round, well, a round, walk, a round of applause. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you for your kind introduction. And may I say, it's absolute, I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Singapore and to have been given the opportunity to speak with you. Just a couple of points before I start. I realize that I'm dealing with cross-cultural situation from my background to your background. So I'm planning only to deal with concepts and generics rather than any tax planning issues or product knowledge or technical matters because they're different for you and me. And because I realize it's cross-cultural, then there are differences in expressions and acceptances of idioms that I may use that you couldn't say. I understand your clients don't like to talk about death because they think it won't happen to them. So you may have to filter out some of what I say. If I refer to he or she or Mr. Client or Mrs. Prospect, I'm not being uh, sexist, so please forgive me on that. Don't take offense. And if I go from pounds to dollars, it doesn't really matter, but I'm meaning dollars. The slides are all in dollars, but I may slip out with pounds. And anything that I say that might be of use to you, make sure you check it with your training department or your compliance department in case it's something you can't do in this country. As you've heard, I'm Scottish. And for those of you who may be wondering, this is not a speech impediment. This is my accent but my England is very powerful, so I hope you'll all understand me. If my voice drops too low, could somebody put a hand up or let me know? And if I'm speaking too quickly, could you let me know? I'm told that you're all top producers here, or aspiring to be top producers, and well done to all of you for whatever production you've had last year. Could I have a show of hands? How many people last year had their best year ever? One. Well done over here. The only one. How many? Good. Well done. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. How many fell below their target? How many started out with figures? Honesty there. Started out with a target and didn't reach it. Okay. Probably more than are admitting it. Okay, can I then ask everybody to raise one hand? Everybody. Now, keep your hand up if last year's production is the absolute maximum you're capable of. <laughs> so we've established one thing, that no one's here wanting to produce only what they're currently producing. We all agreed on that. So you're here to see if you can pick up some ideas to help you do better, right? I'm here because in all modesty, I'm already doing it and have been for many years, which is why I've been asked to speak to you groups like this for a long time. 
And I'm going to offer you some thoughts on what I do now to achieve my production. Much of what I do hasn't changed over all the years. Just get better at doing it. And hopefully you can contrast it with what you're doing to see if doing what, some of what I'm doing or refreshing what you used to do can help to improve your own production. And in sharing a few rules, ideas and philosophies, if you adopt them, as I have done, it's helped me achieve what I want. But here's the deal. Since I'm giving up my selling time to come to help you, then you must make a commitment to me, but more importantly to yourselves, to go away committed to improving. To take away a few or maybe even just one idea that you can use that will make you better, make you perform better and achieve your goals. Is that fair? Okay, let's get started. That this is what my office is like from morning till night. I should say, in 25 years, I've never had a queue at my office. He must be some kind of Superman. The credit crunch doesn't affect him. <laughs> or they think that I do have a magic wand or a secret formula. Do any of these excuses seem familiar? So having got that nonsense out of the way, I thought I'd devote the first part of the talk before the break, built around answering this question, and perhaps later I'll share with you some specific sales ideas, phrases, and concepts that you can use, and which, which I use and which I'm sure you could use. Okay? There's something to read. Sign <coughs> significant because the lion is your national symbol. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up knowing it must run faster than the fastest lion. Every morning, a lion wakes up knowing it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. So it doesn't matter if you're a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up, you better be running. You should consider for yourself the broad concept. Has anybody heard of the broad concept? Okay, this was a uh, presentation at Million Dollar Roundtable 30 years ago, in fact, 1979. And I would recommend that you get a copy of the disc or the tape as it is, uh, tape now, disc now, I should say, and listen to it. It's a must listen to because it will teach you lots of things about selling life assurance without actually mentioning life assurance is one of the aspects. But it teaches you four questions to ask. Where are you now? Where would you like to be? What are the various options for getting there, for me to get there? And which is the best option for me right now? Now, the first two are so important, and only you know the answers. Where you are now is a product of many things, your training, your past management, your attitude, your experience, your existing colleagues, your work pattern, your financial needs, your environment, your colleagues, your support, and so on. So consider these for yourself. Where do you want to be? Again, only you can determine that. Is it to increase your production by 10 or 20 or whatever percent, or to be top in your unit, top 10 in your company, MDRT, court of the table, top of the table, you should decide these. But these are all financial and numerical. And of course, there could be many others, such as to be well respected, to be technically supreme, to be an influence on other people, to increase your enjoyment in the business, to manage other people, to have less of the boring tasks to do, and so on. Where do you want to be? And it's very important in considering these two aspects that you do so from the dual perspective of business and personal life. I'll mention quite a bit about MDRT, or you'll hear me using the expression, but they devised, or somebody spoke on the concept of the whole person, not just about business life, about business life interacting with family and social community life. 
So you must consider the questions of where you want to be in, the terms, or in terms of both. It's very important, as I say, consider, obviously one impacts, your, your business life and your personal life impact on each other, and there's no point in being a success in the office and a failure at home. There are three main attributes, in my opinion, and without being glib, these are necessary for effective change. Focus, discipline, and activity. Let's catch it. And activity, there we go. May seem oversimplistic, but unless you can clearly focus on what it is you want to achieve, where do I want to be, then you're not going to get there. Imagine setting off on a long car journey with no map, no sat-nav, to a place you've never been before. What chance do you have of getting there? Pretty small. Once you have the clear focus, you have to determine the best way to move towards it. The discipline, you need to keep carrying out the tasks to keep you on track to get there. And almost everyone would claim to want success, but few are prepared for the pain of achieving it. Yes, pain, because it involves change, and change is uncomfortable and therefore painful. And it's much easier just to continue in the comfort zone of what you're doing, even if it is an area of, an area of underachievement. You have to change to improve. No option. Just like a rock, cli rock climber or mountaineer, in order to achieve a new position on the mountain, he has to let go of what he's holding on to to reach up, to move up the mountain. It doesn't matter how scary it is, he has to do it. And this is, there is a price to pay, and this is determined by how high you are aiming and how much you want it. And you have to determine whether you're prepared to pay the price. No pain, no gain. You've heard it before, and it's true for us. Activity is the third key element. And it must be focused or channeled activity. There's no point in knowing what you want and working out how you can achieve it being fooled to the brim with confidence or knowledge if you don't concentrate on seeing enough people all the time. And I'll talk more about that shortly. But I've seen girls and guys in my offices who talked a good game, but they were like the Olympic flame. They never went out. And here's an activity tip from MDRT meeting, and it just works. How many of you Keep a diary for appointments. Many of you keep last year's diary. Seriously, lots of people do. Many of you have got the year before. Yeah, okay. Until very recently, I had them from 1984. Don't know why. However, how about going through last year's diary or the year before or the six months that have gone and five months in this year? There must be names and people in there who you had good rapport, had good discussions, and got close, but just didn't close the business. But it's still there to be closed. So why not add them to a work in progress type sheet? And in addition, a stress in addition to your normal activity, go back and see them. You'll find some gold nuggets in there. People that are already warm to you, but whatever the circumstances were, yeah. So how do you start to change once you've gone this, through this process? Well, I would suggest the first place is to observe what successful people do. Because and ignoring unsuccessful people, because they can't offer you anything. They can't help you if you're moving up and they're not. Is it that successful people are first into the office? Often, that's true. Is it that they're last to leave the office? Often, that's true as well. Is it that they, when they're working, they are working? They're not talking about last night's football, movie they saw, new colour of lipstick, latest fashion, the Beckhams, whatever. They're there to work and they're working. And if you're to emulate them, you should copy their habits. Mix with positive thinking because positive, positive thinkers 
because positive thinking is necessary. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're usually right. And avoid the negativity that surrounds the, the failures. 10%, probably Luffy will find, close them down, don't like them, bump away, gone. And you need this 20 top future-based clients, top 20, see them four times a year, and if you see them, they'll give you 50% of your business. Those top, tw not top 20%, top 20 clients. They'll give you 50% of your business. And as I said, profile the ones you've got to see what common threads run within these clients. If you're good with doctors earning certain amounts or teachers doing this or that, you'll get a pattern of their incomes, how you met them, how you got together with them, the relationship you've got. And you might find that you are good with batches of doctors or dentists or lawyers. And that's the kind of clients you should be looking at because they're the ones that are making up your A clients just now. So what is the input? You're too shy, this lot. So I'll tell you in an example, and bear with me, I know it's a bit tedious, but last year you did 40,000. Let's say you had 160 appointments over the 40 weeks. Every appointment was worth $250, every appointment. And your 80 sales, hypothetically, each sale is worth $500. So last year's input was 160 appointments over 40 weeks, which was four appointments per week. That's the input. That you can control. How many appointments do you have per week? That you can control. And it's important to keep records because just like an athlete in training needs a stopwatch to determine if progress is being made, then you can see exactly what it took to achieve what you achieved and what changes are necessary to break it down. You should look at the production, divide it by the number of sales and the average size of each sale and divide the number of appointments you held to get the sale so you know I need to have three appointments to get one sale, which gives me X dollars. Then I need to have six appointments to have it. And just do the sums. So you produced the 40,000 last year, each appointment, 250, and you held a two appointments. Been through that, sorry. So if you want to do 80,000 this year, I'm saying you feel you can go from 40 to 80, this year's target of 80,000, what do you have to do to do 80,000 this year on this hypothetical example? Mathematicians amongst you, last year you needed four appointments a week to do 40,000. What do you need to do? What's the input for this year's target of 80,000? Somebody said it. Eight appointments a week. Easy peasy. People in this business, activity, people in this business, no matter how bad they are, if they see people, they'll eventually make a sale. They might have to see loads of people, and it might be their mother who buys from them out of sympathy, or their brother-in-law, or somebody that takes pity on them and buys. But they've now made a sale. So if they want to make two sales, all they have to do is see twice as many people. And that's what this is about, the activity. And if you're ahead of target now, or at the half year, what should you do? Well, I would suggest you just ignore the excess. You're so many thousand dollars ahead, just ignore it. Still work the plan and do your eight appointments a week for the remainder of the year. And if you're $12,000 ahead just now, you'll be at least $12,000 ahead at the end. And if you're below target now, don't go back and rewrite your plan to take your second half target down. Work the plan for the second half and at least the worst position you'll be in is you'll only be behind at the end of the year what you were behind at the half year. And if you step up the activity, you'll catch it up. Uh, improve your figures. I'm going to show you a couple of slides now which are not so clear, but I'll explain the background. This is my very first attempt or knowledge of breaking it down. And I hadn't heard of Ben Feldman. I hadn't read as many books, and I hadn't been 15 times to MDRT. But this was just my attempt. Over six months, in my first six months, I produced commissions of, first year commissions of £8,000, give or take. 
Targets for next year, what am I going to do, my manager said. I said, I have no idea. But Kestrel, which was a level they had, was 16,000. So eight and eight, 16, I can do that. I'm going to aim for Kestrel. So then they announced the company convention for doing the level above that, which was Falcon, which was 24,000, would get me to Hong Kong for a week on a convention. And I thought, I'm going to Hong Kong. I'm nailing my colors to the mast. I'm going to Hong Kong. So I had written out what I thought I needed to do to do my 16,000, and I went back and looked at the figures and reworked them, simple as they were, to do 24,000. And then I stuck to it, and I stuck to it, and I worked through and worked through, and in that first full 12 months, I did 32,000. I did double my original target, and I went to Hong Kong, and I had a fabulous Ben Feldman's. Time. Everybody heard of Ben Feldman? No. There's a lot of no tongues, <laughs> Alfie. No hands. Ben Feldman was probably the greatest life assurance salesman there's ever been. And he achieved all sorts of things in his company, year after year, bigger and bigger productions. And then he was asked, what's your target for this year? And he said, well, I'm going to write $50 million of life cover. 50 million US dollars. Don't be silly, you'll never do that. How could you put, you know, people scoffed at the idea, 50 million dollars. He said, it's not all that much. It's only a million dollars a week. It's only 200,000 a day. Surely we all know somebody who needs 200,000 of life cover. And he did his 50 million. And I think the year after he did 100 million. And you just have to see the people. How many appointments do I need? It's no way, if you work out, you need 10 appointments a week. There's no point in then saying, right, I'm going to do 80,000, 10 appointments a week, and then only having four appointments a week because you're not going to do it. So here's an appointment tip for you. Here's an appointment you can take away and use right now how to get appointments. Go to your diary, top of the page for each working day, let's say, and write the numbers three, two, one at the top of the page. And then when you get to the office, first thing, first thing you do, or when you start working, if you work from home, before you do anything else, is start making calls until you have three appointments. And when you make each appointment, score off the three, score off the two, score off the one. Doesn't matter if the appointment's for this week, next week, or six weeks ahead. If you do that every day, and you make, create three appointments every week, you will double or treble your production. You'll soon be up right this down. Your confidence grows as you perform better. That's the first thing. Your closing ratios improve. Your case size increases because you're less afraid to lose for a bigger case. You're less afraid to sell bigger if you're busy. And this is self-perpetuating because as you become more confident, you relish going out to see people because you're on a roll. So write this down now. A full diary lets you sell with professional indifference. And remember to quote who you heard it from. I joked about having a long queue outside my office, this big snake, or outside your office. Imagine you did. How would you deal with clients? Mr. Client, this is what I think you should do. Yes or no? Next. You wouldn't be frightened to lose the sale because you, so you can be professionally indifferent. I don't mean treat the clients badly, but you're not. If you've only got two appointments a week in the week and somebody cancels, you're under pressure to sell to that one because you want figures on the board because you want a check at the end of the month, right? If you've got 10 appointments and the first one says, no, it's okay, I've got nine more to go, I've got eight more to go, and you just have a different attitude. Okay. Here's my script. Now, it's coming up here as a script, but it's in my heart, and hopefully I can say it word perfect without re reference to it because that's how it should be. But let's say I've had a referral from you to you. 
first of all, I would say something to you which is along the same lines. Bill, but this is, I've come to you and I've made the appointment, so I'll see you on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Have ready all your da 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 da. Bill, just before you go, there's something that's very important. You don't see if you want to read it. Because of the standard of work that I do and my time in the business, I now only take on new clients that I meet through personal introduction and recommendation. And I would like to think, Bill, if you value my advice or come to value my advice and respect my integrity, that you will be comfortable to introduce and recommend me to others in the same way as we met. Is that okay? The kind of people I like to meet, Bill, are people like you who are successful, who run their own business, and who have economic potential and are responsible and who you think might benefit from a discussion with me. Is that okay with you? And he says, yes, that's fine. Perhaps we could talk about that when we meet. So I haven't seen him yet, but there is something I want to... And I do it in low key, and I just explain it. It's just as part... You need to give me the referral. So no, I just, just like ask that. clients, can I pop in and see you just for a few minutes? I just want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm not here to sell you anything. Mr. Client, why have you kept me a secret? What do you mean? Well, I find that clients who value my advice recommend me to others, and I haven't had any recommendations from you. <laughs> now, you know, but that's how the client will treat it as well, and they say, I didn't even realise what you want. Okay? I'd like to meet people who, like you, are in their own business. Who do you respect? I'd like to meet people by, like you who have just moved house, who have just had a family, just started a family, just, and ask them there and then, just but not to sell them anything else. Or tell them, our clients get best value when we act for the whole family. I'd like to meet your parents. I'd like to meet your brothers, your siblings. I'd like to meet your children, depending on where you're dealing because if you're dealing with life assurance and trusts and death and assets passing down or what's going to happen to the estate, the will, etc., it's going to affect all the different generations. So our clients get best value when, they act, when we act for the whole family. I'd like to meet your parents. In the UK, and I presume it might be the same in Singapore, on holiday weekends, Saturdays, the do-it-yourself outlets are full of people who rush in to buy drill bits. You know what drill bit is? Zzzz. What do they buy? What do they want? How many drill bits do they want? What do they want? They want holes. What do they buy? They buy a drill bit because they need the... So nobody really wants what our products are. They want what they do. Back to the broad concept, as I said, if there's no problem, there is no sale. But if the problem is big enough, he'll pay the premium to solve the problem. You have to sell the problem. So when you leave the office, you can't be thinking, I'm going out to see this guy. I'll talk to him about disability insurance, because maybe he does it. You have to develop the problem and make sure it's there, make sure it's live in his mind. Back to this thing about personal time and family time to close this first session. It's so important that almost before you decide on what your numerical and uh, financial goals are, you determine what is not working time. This again, the MDRT speaker came up with this whole person concept that it's not just about business, interaction with your family, your community, your church, your charity, and the other aspects of your life. And your personal time should be, should Determine when you're not working, when it's family time, when the office door is firmly closed because the family door is open. So if you don't want to work Saturdays or Sundays, block them out your diary. Take them out for personal and family commitments. If you don't want to work Tuesday evenings, block it out your diary. Families spell love, not L-O-V-E, but T-I-M-E. They want your time. And I'm not saying that you should try to be part-time in what needs to be a full-time career. But you must balance the priorities 
And in truth, if we were, and nobody admitted it, I'm not, if we were having 12 appointments a week, if you allow travelling time and everything else, that's a maximum of 24 hours. Almost finished the session. Just on that note, though, I'll give you a quick joke about actuaries. When a lawyer and an accountant and an actuary are arguing whether it's better to have a wife or a mistress. <laughs> All the naughty laughs there. The lawyer recommends a mistress on the grounds that it'll avoid any problems with alimony. The accountant says, uh-uh, you're wrong. You're better to have a wife because you get the tax advantages. <laughs> and the actuary says, you're both wrong. What you want is a wife and a mistress. Then you can tell your wife you're with your mistress, you can tell your mistress you're with your wife, and you can spend more time at the office. Okay, I'm going to talk, this will be a shorter session, and talk about the sales process, little aspects of that, and then go on to some specific phrases and ideas that I use and you can use in actually questioning your clients to make them realize the problems they've got. The psychology of the sales process. Well, when you meet a new client, first time, what's he thinking? Hello? 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 One, two, three, four. What do you think he's thinking? Can I trust him or her? Does he know what he's talking about? And is he thinking of me? That's him. How will he know if he can trust you? Only if you know he can trust you, you he, that he can trust you. How will he know if you know what you're talking about? Only if you know that you know. And how will he know if you're thinking of him? Only if you are. I present my, my, I paint pictures of soft facts. I don't rush in and say, you need life assurance, we need to look at more life assurance, we need to look at... So images that he can imagine, that we can imagine, that will help him realize that there is a problem there. Somebody asked me up the back, how do you sell the problem? Pictures. Mr. Client, what happens if you wake up wired to a machine? Has anybody here visited somebody in hospital recently? Yeah, with tubes going in and out of every orifice and on life support, whatever it might be, they're in hospital and they're wired to a machine. What's the impact of that? And if you ask a client, if you wake up wired to a machine, he can see that. And that's a problem. And then you can develop your discussion from there. Are your children happy at their school? See children playing at school? Would you be happy if they were forced to change school? No, you wouldn't. And then he'll maybe ask you, what do you mean? Why would that happen? Or, well, presumably you pay for their education. It's costing money. And then you're developing into disability income or whatever. But the picture is this I'm sure school. you remember the tsunami or 9-11 or the Chinese earthquake disasters last year. Can you remember what happened immediately after? Well, let me tell you, they set up disaster funds for the bereaved families. And after 9-11... The families were offered an average of two million US dollars each and was considered by some to be not enough. Mr. Client, there will be no Red Cross credit card appeal when you or I die because only 1% of people die in the public arena. So why don't we set up your own personal disaster fund? Present the picture confirm he understands what you mean and you close the sale step by step, not close, open the sale, close, step by step by asking him, does that make sense? Why don't we set up your own personal disaster fund? Does that make sense? And you're gradually closing. How do you feel about that? And we, we run into different kinds of situations where we have simple cases and complex cases. 
They fall into two categories. And I do need your help here. Somebody please shout out. Simple and complex cases. What kind of solutions do we need for simple cases? Simple solutions. What kind of solutions do we need for complex cases? Mr. Absolutely. Klein, or you're Mr. Klein, this is just on the agenda. What has to have happened after this meeting for you to consider it to have been a worthwhile meeting for you? What has to have happened after this meeting for you to consider it to have been a worthwhile meeting for you? Because what we want to do is find out again what's important to him. And it may be nothing to do with our products. It may be he wants to tell us that he's having difficulties with his daughter at school because she's not attending and he needs to find a way to move her school but he hasn't got the fees to do it. Whatever, maybe nothing to do with it. And it happened, when I first heard this, I went to see the CEO of a very large company who sell here in Singapore. They're Scotland-based, but they sell all over the world. And I have great difficulty getting to see him because he's so busy. Or so I thought. Hadn't seen him for well over a year. Went to see him, had that question on my agenda, and had emailed it to him. So I said, Paul, I sent you the agenda. Let's just start at the top. And he said, well, it's quite interesting, actually. Now, this is a guy who's earning half a million dollars a year basic salary, plus bonuses, plus big pensions, plus share options, plus intelligent guy running a company, turning over, not sure, 57 million. He's a CEO. But he said, that's interesting, actually. What I wanted to say is, I find that we try to tackle too much at the one time. And I really can't absorb the figures and the, the numbers all at once. And that's part of the reason why I've been keeping you at a distance. I thought MDRT came in here. But many of sales ideas well, that I'm going to share now some are concepts which will help you sell problems and increase clients' realization of the problems and ways of expressing it. They're not magic formulas. Anything that you hear that's worthwhile, for me or anybody else, you've got to adopt it and adapt the concept to your own style, personality, culture, vocabulary. I could say things to clients that you would say, oh, I can't say that. So I'll say to a client, Mr. Client, your life assurance is a joke, which I learned from Tony Gordon. And they laugh and they say, what do you mean? I mean you're earning $120,000 a year and you've got £80,000 of life assurance. It's a joke. Oh, so what should I have? And they do... If I was to pass your file around the office, Mr. Client, they'd all have a good laugh at it. And they laugh as well. Okay, just moving on to some of the ideas that, and phrases. I've had it, this says disability income and there's others that say life. They're usually interchangeable. The, the, the phrases, you could change it to be life assurance one-liners, life, life assurance phrases. But I've just happened to do these as disability income. Just before I do that, here's a couple of great phrases that you might use in the discussion when you reach an impasse with a client or he's asking you a question that you're not quite... You're ready to answer, but you want to make sure it's moving towards closing the sale. So he asks you a question, do I really need all this life cover? Mr. Client, do you want me to be honest or do you want me to be diplomatic? Now, a few sniggers around there, so I think some people are still awake. But he always says, I want you to be honest. And once he says that, you've got him. Because he takes it, whatever answer or retort you're going to give him is now going to be honest. So he says, I want you to be honest. Well, of course, you need this life cover, Mr. Client, because I think you need a million pounds. You've only got 400,000. If you're 600,000 short, what do you think? Okay. But you can use it in many different contexts. And the other, another one is you reach also a point where you're maybe batting backwards and forwards and then you say to him, Mr. Client, can I make a suggestion? You might be thinking on your feet as you're doing it. Can I make a suggestion? And he says, yes, what do you suggest? And again, he's asking you, that's a buying signal. That's him wanting to do, can I make a suggestion that perhaps we sort out the figures a bit later, but let's get you checked out by the doctors to see if you're as good on the inside as you look on the outside 
and then we can move forward to get the actual premiums and the actual sums assured. And he, you've, he's asked you to make a suggestion, therefore he's likely to receive it well. Business card, this is terrific and very powerful. Hand your client or your prospect your business card face down. And a pen, if he hasn't got one. I want you to put down the names of three people you know who are in a position to continue your salary or your commission or your income for the rest of your life if you can't go to work. So he's looking at you, struggling and awkwardly. And so you encourage him, well, don't you have three? Go ahead, just give me one. If you've got one name that you can write down who will pay your income for the rest of your life or your rest of your working life, give me one. What? No family? No friends? No business associates? Well, I know one. Turn the card over. <laughs> Why don't we discuss what level of benefits you need? Saving, I've put for retirement, but could be for education. Mr. Client, if you had 60 miles to travel and only one hour to get there, how fast would you have to go? You don't have to give them this on one piece of paper. You can just ask them the question, 60 miles an hour. If you leave 10 minutes later, how fast do you have to go? You know the answer now because it's there, 72 miles an hour. And if you leave 20 minutes later, how fast do you have to go? It's 90 miles an hour. It's the same. You run extra risk because the later you start saving for your retirement or your education, the more you have to accelerate the rate of your saving. Does that bother you? And if it makes sense to save, when would be a good time to start? And he'll say, well, I suppose right now. Or he might say to you, well, two months' time would be good for me because... Are you just trying to find a reason to say no? And he always says, no. No, I'm not. No, no. I just want to understand it before I buy it. Big premium. That's a, that's a big premium. Yes, I know it's a big premium. That's the size of your problem. You need a million pounds of cover. That's the size of the problem. Well, this one makes me laugh. My wife will remarry. Has anybody ever had that said? Well, if, you know, she'll get remarried. She can always remarry. Well, there's a, there's a rude answer, which is, well, I haven't met your wife, but would you marry her again? Okay. But my wife will remarry. Here's, this is nice. That's good. Who do you have in mind? Do I know him? I'd like to meet him and have him as a client now if he can afford to take on a wife and three children. Should we marry her off in advance or should we give her a choice? And what is, it's just making him realize the futility of what he's saying. It's just a spontaneous reaction. Shall we marry? Okay, just finish off now. A concept that brought together from two people at MDRT, put them into my words, and it's to do with why people have life assurance. And this is serious when you talk to them about it, and you should deliver it in a very, not somber, but very serious note. Mr. Client, let me tell you about the miracle of life assurance. Because you'll be able to reach back from the grave and pay all the bills. Let me tell you about the miracle of life assurance. You will be able to reach back from the grave and continue your children's education or whatever. You'll be able to reach back from the grave and make sure the business survives for your, for, for your children, for your sons. The miracle of life assurance. And time doesn't permit me, but I'll share with those who stay later if you want a real life example where the second party just died and the funds that they set up using that exact expression investment for grandchildren's education they've both now died and the grandchildren are still being educated from this fund that's the miracle of life assurance 
And lastly, from Tony Gordon's words, don't ever be ashamed of what we do. You're the closest, the nearest to an angel your clients will ever meet. Because you can create immortality for your clients and for yourself. The life assurance that you arrange for him will give him immortality after he dies. And the life assurance you arrange for him, for him and your own will give you immortality. I hope if you've enjoyed this and you've picked up some points, one or two points, and that you can go forward to do better things. And when Prudential give you the feedback forms, can you be kind? And maybe they'll ask me back again. But one of my teachers said one time, stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and sit down to be appreciated. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much, Jack. Yes, we've certainly enjoyed the talk.